you know, it was really interesting. I wanted to see who was going to come today. And it's funny because people are coming up to us asking if they're samples. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought I would share that. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kelly Boyce Heimbaugh, and I proudly serve as president of the Chautauqua Women's Club. Welcome to our Contemporary Issues Forum lecture. We invite you here to join us every Saturday at 2 p.m. through August 20th. Next week's speaker is Mark Becker, former president of Georgia State University. Mark led the transformation of Georgia State from a formerly little-known commuter school into one of the nation's premier urban research universities. We are very fortunate to have him, so please join us. For 133 years, the Chautauqua Women's Club has provided innovative programming, dynamic events, leadership opportunities for women, and life-changing scholarships for students. Our leadership and legacy is one of significant influence, both on the grounds of the Chautauqua community, as well as outside on society. To date, we have provided almost $1.8 million to Chautauqua Institution in scholarships for students in the schools of performing and visual arts. We're very proud of that. Our influence can be seen on society through leadership in the women's suffrage movement, the League of Nations, the Equal Rights Amendment, as well as safe working conditions for employees. Our legacy includes such greats as Eleanor Roosevelt, Amelia Earhart, and Sandra Day O'Connor, just to name a few. If you are a member of the Women's Club, we thank you and thank you, encourage you to get involved. If you're not yet a member, please consider joining. Volunteering, by the way, is the easiest way to make friends. We have a membership table right over there, Nancy and Hope, they're over there. Um, you can sign up there, or you can sign up on our website, or you can come down to our lovely house right next to the Athenaeum down at the lake. We are a welcoming community to all, and that is why we are known as the heartbeat of Chautauqua. So thank you for your support and participation. Next Saturday, August 13th, after our lecture at 5 p.m. in the Athenaeum Parlor, please join us for the life sketch and popular music of George Gershwin. There will be an early dinner followed by a performance by Swing Tet, a popular eight-piece band from Pittsburgh. Tickets can be purchased on our website, and I believe the registration is closing on Tuesday. So if you want to go, please go to our website and sign up. Today, I am thrilled to welcome Jason Wilde. His talk title is Cannabis, Illegal to Essential, The Evolution of the Plant's Perception and the Opportunities Ahead. He will talk for approximately 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes or so of Q&A. After his talk, please queue up at one of the two mics right here. I know there will be a lot of questions. Please, only one question per person to allow others a chance to ask questions, and please refrain from asking follow-up questions. Thank you. So I guess this summer wouldn't be a normal trip to Chautauqua without some sort of travel snafus. Last night, Jason experienced a flight delay due to the rainstorm. We are really glad you made it. I promise before you leave, you will understand the magic of Chautauqua. So thank you for hanging in there. Jason Wild is the chairman of Terrasend and the former chairman of Arbor Pharmaceuticals. He is also president and chief investment officer of JW Asset Management. Jason is a great success story. He has championed money management, cannabis, and entrepreneurship. Jason grew up in his father's pharmacy, pricing and stocking shelves. So it is no surprise that Jason graduated from the Arnold and Marie Schwartz College of Pharmacy. He received his license as a pharmacist in 1997. However, he quickly discovered his acumen for investing. A year later, he founded JW Asset Management. 
And with $80,000, he turned it into hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. As one of the early adopters of medical marijuana, Jason today is razor focused on increasing Terrasen's US market share as a multi-state operator, more commonly known as MSO. They currently operate in California, Michigan, Florida, Maryland, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, with more coming. Under the brand names that you may recognize, Apothecarium, Gage, Eulira, and many more. So the, ind the cannabis industry is exploding, and we are very grateful to have one of the foremost cannabis industry leaders with us here today. So let's give Jason a warm Chautauqua welcome. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, kind words, Kelly. Uh, and thank you to the Women's Club uh, for having me. Uh, and to more specifically, uh, also uh, Lyle uh, Himbaugh. I actually, I, I just learned this weekend, you pronounce it Heimbaugh, right? Heimbaugh. 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 Where, where's Lyle? Oh, there he is. Okay. I just wanted to thank Lyle and, uh, and Kelly for, for having me here. Uh, I uh, definitely, I've only been here for, I don't know, less than 12 hours or something like that, or a little more than that. Uh, and I definitely get the magic. Uh, of Chautauqua, it's uh, thank you for making me uh, schlep up here. You know, nine hours or whatever, it, however many hours it took me to get here. It's definitely uh, definitely been worth it. I've never I've never seen any place like this. It's very 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 special. Uh, so, again, thank you for having me. Um, my uh, topic today is cannabis. Uh, cannabis has been around and has been used for thousands and thousands of years. There's actually been recent discoveries of uh, cannabis uh, oils in uh, some of the uh, stone uh, bowls and uh, in, in ancient temples uh, around the, the, uh, the Dead Sea. So it's been used for thousands and thousands of years uh, and it has a very, very good safety profile. Nobody's ever died from cannabis. So that is, I think uh, I read a stat yesterday that uh, eight people a year die from uh, drinking like bad milk or uh, there's there's so many things that uh, have multiple uh, deaths per year uh, and cannabis uh, is uh, has a very high margin of uh, safety so uh, when I was uh, when I was younger I was a uh, I found the cannabis not not much younger but when I after college I found the cannabis uh, was something that uh, helped me be a little bit more creative I was always uh, doing, uh, you know, focused on, on business and, and starting and running the fund. But I found that often if I consume cannabis, that it helped me look at a problem in a, in a different way. It helped me be more creative in that, in that perspective. And, and I was able to uh, problem solve. Uh, so I had sort of, uh, in my early 20s, uh, you know, bec become a, uh, a consumer of it. Uh, and then uh, just in the last eight years or so, uh, I got a call from a uh, banker up in Canada telling me that cannabis had been uh, legalized for medical use in Canada. Uh, a patient, a medical patient, had gone to the, uh, had taken a case all the way to the Supreme Court uh, and uh, won the right to be able to uh, have her cannabis, and therefore the whole country was going to be rolling out a legal program. Uh, I thought that that was uh, uh, amazing. Uh, I usually, as a fund manager, I like to go out and visit companies uh, because I always find that uh, even if I don't uh, uh, invest in that company, I always find that I learn something new. Uh, so I was, uh, in, the, in this case, I was very excited to go up and, uh, and see this cannabis uh, cultivation operation up uh, outside of uh, Toronto. Uh, and I went up there, sat down with the, uh, with the CEO of the company, uh, and this was a very medically oriented company, and he... Uh, laid out all of the medical uses for cannabis. And I was sort of uh, uh, blown away. I mean, I had always, people always make the joke, uh, oh yeah, you know, he's using it for his uh, glaucoma. Used to be, you know, back in the, uh, back in the day, uh, that was uh, sort of one of the known uh, accepted medical uses. But I learned that the truly the uh, uh, largest indication for cannabis uh, was and is pain. Uh, and also, this the first time I went up to Canada was 2014. 
the, uh, our country and lots of other countries were already in the throes of the opioid epidemic. Uh, and it was, that was the first time it was, it was pitched to me uh, and shown that this was a, a real, that cannabis was a very good uh, harm reduction tool versus uh, uh, putting patients on, uh, on opioids. Uh, and th that even back then in the states in the U.S. that had legalized medical cannabis, that opioid abuse rates and deaths had gone down. Uh, so that was pretty, uh, that was pretty powerful. Uh, there were also all of these other uh, medical uses that, that we're seeing, uh, that patients were seeing wide scale um, success with uh, epilepsy, uh, anxiety, um, sleep, uh, sleep disorders, uh, many, uh, many of the neuro neurological conditions like uh, Parkinson's and, uh, and uh, uh, Alzheimer's. So I was, uh, I remember coming back from that, uh, from that trip up to see this cultivation facility and like, I felt like the whole world opened up. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I was originally, uh, I'm originally a pharmacist and Arbor Pharmaceuticals was a company that, that we had started uh, back in 2010 and we had a successful uh, uh, exit from that. And I was so excited that I had something that I was so excited that a, a sort of a whole new industry or a whole new sector that was open for me to be able to uh, be able to invest in. And I, I felt I looked at it like pharmaceuticals, uh, but sort of the only part of the pharmaceutical sector that I thought was going to grow substantially over the next uh, over the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, so over the next three years, I, I crisscrossed the, uh, the country uh, and uh, met with as many of the uh, as many companies as I could uh, up in Canada. I was still uh, afraid to be to invest in the U.S. Uh, like I think most invest most U.S. investors, uh, because it wasn't uh, legal nationwide uh, at that point. Uh, but uh, but I uh, I just felt like uh, Canada was going to be the preview to the rest of the world, and that uh, you could pretty much send product to any other legal uh, entity in the world other than the U.S. from Canada if you had uh, what's called a GMP certified uh, facility. Um, so what, uh, what happened next was that, I, that um, I think I realized that the Canadian market uh, was not going to be, you know, the Canadian market is generally 10% of the size of the U.S. The U.S. market started to really Become a uh, a lot larger and more substantial, and that's when we started. Uh, uh, that's when we started investing in the U.S. and where we pivoted uh, TerraSend, which is a company that we had a large investment into uh, in the U.S. Uh, to take us back again to sort of uh, the history, what has happened over the last uh, 20 years or so is that uh, more and more people are using or realizing that cannabis is a safe alternative. The states uh, that um, that are legalizing it realize that uh, that it is uh, not only beneficial to uh, to the people in the state, but it's a great um, a great uh, help in funding the tax dollars that are uh, generated and the jobs that are generated are a great help uh, in uh, in these municipalities and uh, in these uh, in these state budgets. So. Uh, what's happened is the whole perception and the stigma around cannabis is um, has has really started to shift. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, and I didn't even know this until 2019, that cannabis was uh, all the laws codifying uh, the um, the prosecution essentially of cannabis offenses. Uh, all really started in the 1930s, and it was really led by a gentleman named uh, uh, Harry Ainslinger. And Harry Ainslinger, what, what happened was cannabis was coming in through uh, two main places in the U.S., through New Orleans into the jazz scene uh, and up through uh, Texas from uh, Mexico. Uh, and Harry Ainslinger, there's proof in terms of video interviews where he was not a... Uh, fan of people of color. And he wanted to uh, essentially, the codifying of all of these cannabis uh, offenses and the, and the prosecution of them was a way for uh, him to be able to, uh, or for the country or, or, or the, the municipalities and the states that codified this, uh, to prosecute people of color and put them in jail. 
Uh, and that was a lot of the, even the propaganda, because Harry then, I believe, went on to become the first head of the DEA. Uh, and the whole war on drugs, Nixon uh, made uh, marijuana a Schedule One drug, which means that it has no valid uses whatsoever uh, in, the, in the 70s. And he was uh, influenced by this gentleman, uh, Harry Anslinger. So over the years, they created all of this propaganda there was, um, you know, the, the movie uh, Reefer Madness that, uh, and if you see the posters, it's crazy. It says, you know, like, you know, once he had a, uh, you know, a puff of that joint, he went crazy and, you know, you know, tried to, or, or killed somebody or, or something to that effect. It was, there's been propaganda uh, that's been spread about the dangers of cannabis, certainly versus any benefits for roughly the last uh, 60 years. Uh, and I think when a lot of people realize part of the reason that it was done and sort of the genesis of it, uh, they realize that maybe uh, a lot, even most of those arguments uh, uh, against it aren't even valid or they're not even, or they're not even true. For example, you know, one of the uh, stigmas around cannabis is that it's all people that are, uh, you know, lazy and unmotivated and, uh, you know, uh, are unhealthy. Uh, and... Certainly over the last 15 years in places like California, it's been proven to be pretty much the opposite. There is, uh, it's the people that are, uh, that are vegans and are, uh, you know, uh, only eating, as my wife calls it, uh, only eating clean foods uh, and uh, doing uh, yoga every day and are very, very productive uh, members of, of society. Uh, that is... Uh, that's the opposite of the stigma that was that was always spread over uh, over all of these uh, all of these years, and uh, I think that over the over the last uh, ten or fifteen, certain certainly the last uh, the last uh, even five, uh, even more so, the uh, all everybody is starting to realize it. The politicians are starting to realize it. They're starting to realize that it just doesn't make any sense that there's still people that are sitting in jail with sentences, you know, life sentences uh, because they had uh, three cannabis or marijuana offenses. Uh, and that it doesn't make sense because there are uh, so many uh, positive uh, attributes of cannabis in terms of those lower death rates, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, I had a good quote. Hold on one second. I'm sorry about that. I had a quote from a Snoop Dogg uh, that I wrote down that I thought was really, really, uh, I, I thought it was great. Um, and this is, uh, I was going to say, comparing it to alcohol. And not that I'm judging alcohol or spirits, but he said, and I'm going to clean this up. Uh, you could put a thousand blanks, you know, uh, you can put a thousand friends in a room or, or, who don't like each other. Uh, you put some weed in there. Uh, they're gonna be taking selfies and doing all kinds of cool stuff. You could, you could put four people in a room who don't li like each other the same way and one glass of alcohol and someone's gonna get shot. And that is the reality about cannabis versus uh, so many uh, other things in, in our, uh, in, that are legal uh, amongst uh, all the westernized uh, nations. And it's a, uh, it was always, another part of the propaganda was always that it was a gateway drug. Uh, I mean, we've heard, I've heard, remember hearing that for the last, you know, 30 or 40 years, ever since I was in, I was in uh, uh, high school. But there are studies that show that it's the opposite, that it is used uh, very successfully to get people off of, as I mentioned, uh, opioids and to get people uh, th uh, to consume less alcohol. Uh, when I actually, when I started uh, uh, consuming cannabis back in, when I was in my 20s, my alcohol consumption, I went from having, probably having a drink every night to having a drink, uh, having one or two drinks the whole, uh, the whole week. So there are, um, there are just uh, so many uh, positive attributes and so many sort of ridiculous things going on right now in the world that keep it from, uh, from still being, uh, uh, or from being legalized. 
Uh, and we are really right now at sort of the intersection of all of that, of bringing cannabis sort of out of the shadows uh, into the legal, uh, you know, uh, framework. Uh, 19 states in the U.S. Uh, have approved uh, medical uh, cannabis programs. Uh, many states also have rec programs. What happens in these states is when uh, the medical program starts and the regulators and the politicians and all the citizens realize that everybody's not running around with their hair on fire and uh, crime rates haven't gone up and all of that, uh, they usually, you know, the thing that politicians are, you know, are the most addicted to is, uh, is being able to bring in more tax dollars to fund more projects. So, they, uh, so these programs almost always go from medical to rec. There's a, back when I was first investing about five years ago, uh, a lot of people would say, I'll only invest in medical uh, type uh, cannabis companies and not in rec. Uh, but, and we had started that way as well. But my, th my thinking on that has evolved over the, uh, over the last few years because in my view and seeing all of the harm reduction in terms of alcohol, uh, uh, alcohol abuse and, uh, and opioids, in my view, uh, ever, there are, not everybody, there are a large amount of people who need something every day to help them get by. Whether they're taking a Prozac every morning or they're having a, uh, a cocktail when they get at home uh, at night, to me, they are treating a condition. It's, it's the human condition, but they're treating a condition. Uh, and I feel like uh, cannabis, even in a setting which would be considered rec, uh, or, you know, what they call adult use, not, not medical, I still feel like that is still treating a, uh, a, a condition because it's, uh, because it's uh, helping uh, certain people, uh, you know, get by in a, in, in a given day. Um, so we've, we've generally, uh, not generally, we've, we've completely uh, opened up our investing now to what's called the rec programs and, and the medical programs because they all, as I mentioned, they all eventually uh, go... Um, go wreck when, when the program or, you know, when all these programs uh, work out well, which, which they all have. Uh, in terms of the current, uh, uh, the way the current map looks in the U.S., the West Coast, they were really on the cutting edge in terms of, um, in terms of legal, legalization programs. Um, they went, uh, say, places like California, Oregon, Colorado. Uh, they've all turned down, their rec programs have already been around for at least uh, at a minimum five years, uh, and, but you've had all of the states on the East Coast that have not had legal programs until more, uh, until more recently. So on the East Coast, the only, uh, the only approved uh, programs that are not medical are Massachusetts and New Jersey. Uh, Terrasend, which is the company I'm the chairman of, we're one of the top operators in Jersey. Uh, the program just turned on uh, in, on April 21st of this year. Uh, and it's been there's been a lot of uh, a lot of demand and a lot of uh, a lot of excitement, but I would say it, it hasn't all been a, a walk in the park in terms of the cannabis industry. There are a lot of uh, sort of what would I call them characters that uh, are in this industry. It's you know it's a little bit more out on the edge in terms of legality and all of that. So it is uh, it's harder to find uh, really uh, sort of good people to work with. Uh, and, and also, all of the companies are brand new. I mean, they haven't, you know, most of these people, 90% of these people at any of these cannabis, at any of these MSOs, multi-state operators, uh, have uh, probably 5% of them have worked with each other for more than about a year. So it's almost like, uh, if anybody's a, uh, you know, a sports fan, uh, it, it, I, I call these, uh, these uh, operators uh, out there in the U.S., they're like expansion football teams or baseball teams, where it's all new people working together, and they uh, and it just makes it makes business, uh, you know, generally more difficult because there's. Uh, if I was going to go start an accounting firm, uh, and I wanted to have a great firm, I can go hire one of the best uh, uh, top accountants at another firm that's been doing it doing it there for 20 years. But if I want to hire the best person to run a cannabis uh, company or the best top executives to uh, run a cannabis company, like if they've been doing it for the last 20 years, yeah, I probably don't really uh, want to uh, work with them or they're probably, uh, you know, not enough, uh, not buttoned up enough uh, to be able to uh, uh, handle it in the, uh, in the sort of uh, more uh, legalized, uh, legalized world. Um, so in terms of the framework in the U.S., 
right now it's state by state, either nothing legal uh, or medical or, uh, or uh, medical and rec, uh, but still federally, it's still, uh, cannabis is still considered a schedule one drug and is, uh, and is illegal. Uh, the, uh, the fact that we haven't been able to find some type of uh, compromises in, uh, in Congress uh, to, to pass what, you know, both sides of the aisle at this point are generally at least in favor of medical uh, cannabis. They see the benefits, uh, but the fact is we haven't been able to uh, make any progress uh, from a federal legislation perspective, and that has been another thing that's, that is uh, sort of a heavy burden on any existing operators because there's some, you know, uh, ridiculous uh, type impacts uh, that you have to go through by being, if, if you're, uh, you're doing something that the federal government sees, sees that you're in business and they want to be paid, say, their taxes, but on the other hand, they disallow the vast majority of all of your deductions because they say that you're operating in an illegal uh, industry. So cannabis companies gener uh, essentially uh, pay taxes on their gross profit, not their, not their net profit. Uh, and that's, uh, that's another factor that makes the, the uh, current U.S. industry uh, uh, challenging. Uh, all that being said, uh, I, we're big investors in it because we think that over the years there's going to be more uh, destigmatization of the, um, of the plant. There's going to be more and more uh, studies, in my view, that are going to come out that show uh, uh, even further benefits of cannabis. There's a uh, phase two study going on by GW Pharma where they, uh, for glioblastoma, which is one of the most deadly forms of brain cancer, uh, they did a trial of half THC, half CBD, in addition to the standard of care. Uh, and the patients in the, uh, the uh, arm, the active arm, lived on average 589 days versus 350 days for the uh, people that were on the on regular standard of care. So I do believe that not only uh, will uh, cannabis be, it's already being seen as a, as a, a very good product for uh, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting and other, uh, uh, you know, wasting syndrome, uh, jet stimulating appetites, for, you know, things for people with, uh, with cancer. But I think that we're going to start to see, there's uh, several studies going on where we're going to start to see that, that uh, cannabis actually has anti-cancer and anti-tumor properties. Uh, there's also, there are also studies, uh, the New York Times Magazine uh, had a uh, story uh, last year about how there are some studies that are showing that cannabis actually uh, has, some, has neuroprotective um, benefits uh, for patients uh, over 40 years old. Uh, now, just to be clear, cannabis is not, and I'm strong, I you know, strongly believe that sh cannabis should not be used by, any, by anyone below 21 years old because kids' brains are developing and that is not a good time to be consuming cannabis. But, um, and, and the study and the data show that. Um, but there are starting to be, uh, there's starting to be more talk of its neuroprotective uh, uh, attributes for uh, for people that are uh, that are over 40. Uh, I have you don't know how many times I've had people come up to me and tell me uh, that uh, uh, that they changed from taking Xanax every night uh, before going to bed uh, or an Ambien every night before going to bed. Usually people over 40 or 50 uh, to either CBD or THC CBD uh, uh, you know regular uh, gummies. Uh, and they, uh, even, even today, uh, I was, uh, uh, I told uh, a similar story about how the benefit is that, that they woke up in the morning feeling like the best rested that they've ever felt. Uh, so there's just, uh, in my view, there's, there's going to be more tailwind uh, for the cannabis uh, industry. It's over $100 billion dollar. Uh, revenue industry right now worldwide, most of it's illegal. Uh, about in the US, about 20 billion of it is legal. I think that that's gonna grow to over 100 billion in the next, uh, in the next 10 years or so. And uh, I think that uh, I wanna, I'm, I'm excited to sort of, uh, I feel like I'm 
Um, I have a seat at the table with the, if I look in the pharmaceutical industry, which I came from, it was like, like I almost feel like I'm sort of sitting at the table with the George Merckx of the world and the, I forgot the first name of the guy from Pfizer, but uh, you know, in the, uh, in the late 1800s, uh, it's just such an exciting industry. We know that the demand is, uh, is immense. It's just a matter of um, further penetration of the legal market versus the illegal and unsafe uh, illicit market. Uh, and it is, uh, I, I can't, I remember saying uh, back in 2015 when we made our first investment in the first Canadian company that I, I just couldn't imagine, or I, you know, what was going to, what the progress was going to be over the next five years. And I thought that we were going to uh, have, uh, that the U.S. would be legal by then. I'm surprised uh, that it hasn't been, uh, but I think that the, the uh, industry itself in the U.S., has grown immensely. Uh, these operators are employing thousands and thousands of um, employees, paying uh, lots and lots of uh, taxes, especially because they're not allowed to deduct their expenses. Uh, and this is going to, in my view, gonna, is the next great uh, industry that's going to that's uh, being built here over the next uh, over the next 20 or 30 years. I don't really, I really can't think of too many other industries that uh, that excite me uh, uh, as much as this one. And with that, I would uh, love to uh, take some uh, questions. Yeah. Can we bring her up? We have somebody very eager to ask a question, so we're going to oblige here. I have a little jar of THC that I would love to find how to get more because I have severe sci sci sciatica. I have tried everything, including everything. And the only thing, and Whoopi Goldberg made this. So, and she's out of, she doesn't do it anymore. If somebody can tell me where I can buy this because it is the only thing that, other than having injections every three months and having to go to Pittsburgh, it is, it's topical. I don't ingest anything. And it's, it's, to me, it's a miracle. It's THC. I use just a little bit. And if you can get me some, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a miracle to me. And I'm almost, I don't have much left. I was just going to say, if you, uh, if you were down in my neighborhood in New Jersey, I could uh, definitely uh, help you out. It's too far for me to work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, there are, uh, there's good topicals. They work. Uh, and let me see what I can do to, uh, do to hook you up. Hi. Uh, I'd like to tell you that uh, as uh, an 11-year-old, I had epileptic seizures, uh, and then uh, luckily they put me on pills and stuff, yep. but I still had petite mal, which is you kind of lose yep. things, stuff. Then, and I know you oppose this, at 18 I went to college, <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? The petite malls went away in college, magically, Yeah, <laughs> and I, did, I didn't know that was the reason until 20 years later they did studies or something you know and and so I would I would advocate that epileptics should get it and I yes. think they can get it they yeah uh, and 100% I yeah. agree with you okay and so and, and uh, another thing uh, I'm a historian and it's well documented that on plantations every plantation in the south grew hemp because you made yep. rope with it. Yep. And on every plantation in the fall, there was a festival for the hemp harvest. And the accounts are that people were quite exuberant in yep. those festivals. <laughs> you know? See, because you have to take the leaves off of the plant yep. to make rope. Yep. And then they talk about throwing the leaves into the fire and right. sitting around the fire. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, one, I, I did question you about the epilepsy, uh, you know, for kids yeah. under, under 18 uh, or 21. Uh, it's really important because my experience, and yeah. it's very dramatic. I have been in support groups and, you know, uh, advocated, and sometimes the mothers and fathers don't like it. Yeah, yeah. In the past, now it's, yeah. you know, but so I thank you for your, uh, what you're doing. And I, I think it's, it's important that people know that this is not just about psychological things. Yeah, you, not uh, just for depression, fun. Depression, you know, yeah. that there are physical things like epilepsy. And epilepsy yeah. is a terrible thing, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thankful that it helped me get over yeah. it. Thank, thanks for sharing. I didn't realize when you said that you went to college that you were that you meant that that's when you first tried cannabis and, and it helped with the seizures. Yeah, it's um, you hear a lot of stories like that too. And certainly, you know, all medicines have risk risks uh, and and benefits. And uh, certainly, uh, there are lots of kids, even young kids, that are. Uh, this is a uh, you know, there's a famous uh, girl, Charlotte. There's a strain called Charlotte's Web. She was having, I think, like hundreds of seizures a day. Uh, and, it, and it brought her seizures down to like uh, five or ten a day, uh, and it's uh, there's you know really a large body of evidence that shows that that it works for seizures. And and the company GW Pharma that I mentioned earlier, they got a product uh, called uh, Sativex, uh, and it is it's approved for a certain type of uh, seizure. It definitely works. CBD works too, but you know THC uh, works for for the even harder cases. This set. I'd like you to focus uh, my question just on pain. Yeah. Y- your products come in the form of uh, cookies, gummies, drops, and a smorgasbord of others. Some are per CBD, some have THC. Yeah. So what's the person with pain, what are they supposed to go to get the right prescription for their particular product with what combination, how many, how often, and monitor it over time? I think that's lacking in your industry. Yeah, so so different states have different um, even requirements. Like in Pennsylvania, you there we're required to have a pharmacist on staff for consultation, and there is a lot of uh, good advice that's uh, being given that way. In some other states, uh, like in Jersey, uh, and especially Pennsylvania is a medical program right now, but in the in the adult use or the rec programs, there's not as much of that. And what the people in those uh, stores really rely on is uh, the bud tenders. Uh, in terms of, that's what they call the people that are, you know, the, cust- the, the person that's uh, helping them. And they really, they're able to really uh, give good advice based upon uh, what the products are, uh, you know, that are, that are being currently being carried. They're usually uh, cannabis uh, aficionados or, uh, you know, they're certainly very enthusiastic about it and have tried almost all of the products and can help. But that's a little bit of the difference between, you know, regular pharmaceutical company, you know, uh, approved, you know, uh, FDA approved drugs where they went through all the, all the testing and it's all very technical. And cannabis is a little bit more fuzzy with a lot of that stuff. And, and to be honest, that's, uh, that's part of why a, part of the mainstream uh, medical community is, has, it's taken longer to win them over. Uh, they're now, they're seeing the benefits, but a lot of doctors, they're like, you want me to tell them to go, uh, you know, smoke something or consume something that they don't know exactly, I can't even say exactly how many milligrams are going are gonna to be in uh, the product. Um, so I think that that's, uh, they're still being won over because they've learned that there's a huge margin of safety. With, with cannabis or a huge margin, you know, you have a large margin of error. The worst thing that is really going to happen to somebody is they might get, you know, paranoid or feel like they're having heart palpitations or something mm-hmm. like that. But, you know, lay them down in a, in a dark room and, you know, rub their forehead and tell them everything's going to be all right. They'll usually uh, get past it uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a couple of, uh, in, you know, half an hour or something like that. Uh, good question. Uh, it is, you can go to uh, specifically medical only dispensaries and you can get a lot more sort of science-based uh, advice uh, but the bud tenders they know from firsthand they're they give pretty good advice as well yeah now my question is very elemental uh, you have uh, constantly used the term 
cannabis. Yeah. Uh, and you have not used the word marijuana. Yeah. And I'm wondering, are these exactly the same thing, cannabis and marijuana? Uh, and then there's CBD. And I'm wondering if there's any distinction among these things, and if so, what the distinction may be. Sure. So ca cannabis and marijuana are the same thing. Uh, marijuana has been used, uh, that term's been used less and less over the last uh, eight, or eight, 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 ten years or so, because it also has been uh, recognized that that was a term that, uh, you know, this gentleman, Harry Ainslinger, when he was trying to uh, create an environment to, uh, to make a lot of arrests, they used marijuana. That was the uh, sort of Spanish term for it, or to imply that it came in from Mexico, actually. So, uh, I mean, I always called it marijuana up until a few years ago, uh, but cannabis is generally the more accepted, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess marijuana has been, uh, you know, canceled in terms of the, uh, the, the use of it as a, as a description, because it, that some believe that it was used as like a, a way to, uh, you know, make it about race. And CBD and THC, there are hundreds of what's called cannabinoids in, uh, in any uh, flower, cannabis flower that's uh, harvested. Uh, THC is the most highly, uh, one of the most highly studied one. It's the one that makes people uh, feel uh, more intoxicated. Uh, it's the one that works really well for pain. CBD is another one of these hundred plus cannabinoids. Uh, it has, uh, it helps people uh, for a lot of the same indications that THC works for. THC generally works better for, uh, for anything beyond mild pain. CBD is a little less, is, is less effective for pain than THC is. There's all these other cannabinoids as well that people are uh, starting to isolate now. There's a uh, THCA, which is supposedly a uh, more mild version of THC. There's one CBG that supposedly has uh, appetite suppressant qualities to it. Uh, and companies are starting to be able to isolate these or even make them without, you know, the, do synthesize them without uh, having to grow them, which, you know, I think, I think the medicine should come from the plant, but there are uh, a lot, lots of studies on these more. They're called the rare uh, cannabinoids. Cannabis also, by the way, has terpenes and uh, flavonoids. The terpenes are uh, what, give, what actually cause a lot of the effects as well, uh, and that is what you uh, would smell if, you, if you've ever smelled where, you know, somebody that, you know, had cannabis and it smelled skunky. Those are the terpenes that are, that are in the, uh, the cannabis. There's certain ones that have, uh, there's, there's a terpene called limonene, uh, lim limonene, which is, uh, it gives off a, a fragrant like lemon uh, scent. So um, it's uh, any given st strain of cannabis has uh, a combination of all of these uh, uh, cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, and that's what they call the uh, entourage effect. And that is why a lot of people believe that the whole plant should be used as opposed to if somebody's having a gummy, then it's just THC or just CBD. It's been isolated out of the plant. Uh, there are, are a lot of believers that you need that whole entourage of all the cannabinoids to get the true uh, effects and benefits. Hi. Hi. Uh, the two previous gentlemen asked my question, but I'd just like to move it a little differently, if I yeah. may. I, I thought CBD and cannabis are the same thing. But and, and that's how I don't know you get which yeah. is which and how you can discuss one without discussing the other. So CBD is made from, CBD is one of those cannabinoids, as I mentioned. You can get hemp. I, I should uh, point out sort of the difference between hemp and cannabis. Hemp is um, generally, in order to be legal in all of these states, hemp has to have less than 0.3% THC in it. So, which is, just, which is just a little bit, right, exactly. So, and that's what, so when they passed the farm bill a couple of years ago and legalized uh, hemp, what they really did, they didn't really legalize CBD or legalize any of these other cannabinoids. What they really, they pretty much just excluded THC and, and sort of uh, continued to have a ban against THC and sort of legalized, opened it up for CBD. And there's even arguments that some of those other cannabinoids I mentioned that they could be legally sold uh, in states without a license. 
Right now, though, CBD is you, in the vast majority of U.S. states. You don't need any type of license to make it or sell it. You can cross state lines with it. You, you know, you can uh, ship it out of Florida to you know to convenience stores in in Washington, whatever it is. THC, on the other hand, which is the cannabinoid that I mentioned, intoxicates you. That's what you need to. That's where you need a license, and you need to operate under the state legal. Uh, you know, cannabis but it's uh, a kind of CBD. framework. No, no, they're different. They're different. They're just grown in the same plant in either cannabis or in uh, or in hemp. But they're uh, they're different cannabinoids. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, huh. I use CBD every day. Um, more at night. I have scoliosis and I wear a back brace. So it helps me have a restful night. My question is, I live now in Florida. I've been there for 12 years. And Florida is, allows for medical marijuana. Yep. And recently, the news has been that those who are trying to get a license, are, those who are successful, are white. Those who are black or persons of color have not been able to get licenses. They've, their difficulties put up in their way. So my question is, what are you doing, your organizations, yeah. or people that you know about on the federal level to help make the whole industry legal? Yes, good, good question, and, I, and I, should have, uh, I should have brought this subject up, so thanks for... Uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, reminding me. Um, so, yes, there has been, I mentioned earlier that um, people of color have been arrested like four times the amount of, of times, you know, uh, and, and still are versus uh, white people. And they don't consume, it's not like they uh, consume four times as much. So it's just, it's purely, you know, uh, and clearly uh, unfair. Uh, and. What's been a shame about the industry is that there are very few uh, black uh, operators in these state-level uh, state legal programs. I, it's not because they're not being approved for them, in, in my view. It's just that generally uh, there have been less, uh, less applicants that, uh, can, that have been able to put together the package of what needs to be, what needs to be done in, uh, in, in terms of getting uh, uh, approved and, and getting a license. What we have done- It's more than that in Florida. It's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot more. It's a lack of access to capital. Uh, it is, it, it, it's tons of things. Uh, and what, what I uh, started uh, a year ago, I, I started a, uh, a social equity impact fund with, uh, I don't know if there's any NBA fans here, uh, Chris Weber, the, uh, the Hall of Fame uh, basketball player, and I, we started a fund to fund uh, uh, black and uh, brown led businesses to apply for licenses. But generally, I don't, I don't mean to say that they're not qualified from knowing how to run a business from that perspective, but the, the bigger money uh, that Wall Street has funded, they've put it behind you know, people that, are, uh, you know, that don't have a lot of people of color uh, uh, in their ranks. And those have been, because the states are so stringent and it requires so much money, our facility in New Jersey that we just built and Rec just turned on, it cost us $30 million to build out. Uh, and unfortunately, people of color don't have, don't have access or haven't had access to that same level of investment dollar. And that's what we're uh, trying to do with this fund that we launched. But as I mentioned earlier, cannabis is a, is a hard business. I almost... Uh, you know, I want to help uh, uh, people of color, color make up a, more of a true representation of the industry, like relative to how much of an impact they have on the, on, on the industry and they're part of the culture. But it is, in a certain way, it's almost like I, I have had, uh, sometimes I'll have second, I'll second guess myself and say, this is so hard that unless we execute, you know, everything is, is executed 100% right, we're not gonna make money. Like, I almost feel like uh, I don't, you know, what's the Hippocratic Oath? First, do no harm. I don't want to uh, necessarily, until there's more progress legislatively, uh, a lot of these businesses uh, are not going to be able to be successful. It's just, 
it's just a very, very hard business. I know that's, you know, the, uh, uh, that's not the answer that I think that you were expecting, right. but it that's is. not the one I want, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, we need, to, we need to get more progress uh, in terms of the Safe Banking Act, which is, is hopefully coming close to being passed, and some other things, because right now in the industry, like only the largest companies are going to be able to survive uh, all of the extra, uh, you know, uh, costs and taxes and, and all of that. And whereas a year ago, I was much more uh, sort of strongly believed that we need to get more people of color into the industry. Now, I almost feel like I'm setting them up a little bit for failure unless we make more progress, if that makes sense. Well, uh, I would uh, join everyone else here in thanking you for being here today oh. and for what you're doing. I think it's really an interesting and important work. Thank you. You mentioned uh, that Canada has had this legislation in place for a while now. Yeah. So they, it sounds like they are farther down the road in terms of legislation. What about where they're at compared to the United States in terms of uh, regulating the production and the assurance of quality product and licensing of people that would provide advice yeah. and uh, medical advice about what to use? Where are they compared to where we are here? So Canada really uh, sort of, you know, they were really good from a legislative perspective. They got medical approved. Then in 2018, they approved full uh, adult use or rec where you didn't need a prescription. Uh, and they did that well, and they didn't do the actual program well. They made it so that uh, virtually all sales needed to be funneled through uh, government or provincial distribution, which is the way that alcohol sales uh, mostly work in uh, most of the provinces in Canada uh, as well. And it really, um, it's a lot harder if you're an operator or a grower or uh, you're making products. If you're only talking to one, you can only talk to one buyer for, you know, say Ontario, you know, 40% of the, uh, of the total economy of the, of the country. It, it's, uh, that's one aspect that's very, very difficult. In the U.S., if you have an operation, you have salespeople that are going out and meeting with uh, dispensaries to buy, it's based upon the way, like, salespeople in most industries, you know, uh, do well by developing good relationships with their customers, by, uh, you know, adding value, by building friendships, all, you know, all, all those kind of things. And in Canada, with essentially, you know, one or two people controlling all of the buying for very, very large, uh, you know, uh, provinces, it's, that's made the... Uh, that's, that's made the industry really uh, not uh, do as well up there as, you know, as, say, companies in the, in the U.S. have done. And then the other thing is Canada over-regulated the packaging. So they only allow, you're only allowed, I think, like one color, and your logo can't be more than an inch, uh, than an inch high. And when it comes down to it, cannabis sales are going, cannabis sales and cannabis use are happening everywhere. It's just a matter of whether people are going to come into the, and by the legal you know, tested safe stuff versus the, the illegal stuff. And if you make it so that somebody that walks into a dispensary in Canada, all they see is a wall of, of white boxes with one color and a one inch logo, it's not, it's not an enjoyable or exciting uh, consumer experience for, for Canadians. Uh, and that's why the Canadian market has, uh, has not done very well. Another, you know, fact is the government takes such a huge cut of the, they take about, uh, Canada takes about like 30 cents of every dollar goes to the government. Uh, and it's also made, that's another reason that's made it harder for, uh, for Canadian cannabis companies to do well. From the um, testing and all that perspective, Canada is also stricter than the U.S. It's a nationwide program, so it's sort of like the, you know, Health Canada regulates it, like, like the FDA, they're like the FDA, uh, you know, uh, would in, in the U.S. if it was ever fully legalized. Uh, these state-level programs in the U.S., they're a little bit more, uh, I don't know, they have their own uh, idiosyncrasies. There's some, some things that these states, like, let you, get, let you get away with that you can't believe that they will. And then there's other things that they are so crazy strict about that doesn't even, uh, that doesn't even make any sense. So I would say the U.S. is just more, it's sort of like they say about real estate, like every market is local. It's all about uh, who the regulator is in a given state in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what their standards are or how they are to deal with. 
gentleman who just asked the question asked sort of what I was getting after. You have um, sites, sales places in multiple states. Mm -hmm. Must you grow in each yes. state? Or can you ship across state lines? How are the re things yes. regulated? Yes, so you cannot ship across state lines um, if you're a legal, a state le level legal operator. Uh, and that is when I mentioned the, uh, you know, the competition with the illicit market. That's that's the issue. Is say we have a license in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey, and over the last uh, year there has been uh, even more product coming from California and Oklahoma is a new place for illegal uh, cannabis, and so the illegal operators are shipping this stuff into uh, these U.S. Uh, these states on the East Coast. New Jersey and New York just passed rec legalization uh, and even though say places like New York didn't turn the program on yet they already decriminalized it so I'm sure many of you seen these uh, news articles or, or things that, about how in New York cannabis illegal cannabis operators are acting with impunity they don't even get arrested nothing happens to them they have a, a big truck and a, a big like bus in the middle of uh, by Times Square uh, but for illegal operators everything has to be produced, anything that has THC in it, it has to be produced in the state. There was a story about five years ago, one operator got caught like trying to bring a van full of uh, cannabis from Minnesota into like uh, Virginia or something like that. But um, that, that's what's good. It's good in terms of extra competition. You know, one aspect of Canada that is not good is you're competing since it's legal in the whole country, you're competing in Ontario with product that was grown in you know, British Columbia. In the US, if you're operating legally, it's good that nobody can bring anything from in from out of the state because, you know, let's say like for us in Jersey, we're one of the biggest operators and there's not a lot more capacity built in the state right now. So it's gonna be, those are gonna be, be you know, some better times for us. Uh, but it's also, you know, like in Pennsylvania, I would love if we could take some of that product that we have there and bring it into Jersey because we could, you know, we could do better. So it's, a, it's sort of a catch-22. That would go away if we ever had full-fledged legalization across the whole country. And that, that's, a, that's a fear of some people is that it's going to be, you know, everything's just going to come from California like it does with produce and things like that. Thanks. Sure. Thank, Th thank you for your advocacy. Um, I'm from Oregon. I just arrived today. Mm. And if I had known, I would have brought yeah, a lot more. Yeah, bring a, a, some me. kind of salve or uh, something. But uh, there's there's a uh, cannabis dispensary on every you know street corner in Portland, uh, and it's really quite something. Um, I'm also an ER physician. I've been for 20 years. And regarding the safety issues you talked about, I just want to echo that virtually every day in my practice I see um, harmful effects from alcohol, but I I don't think I've ever really seen anything terribly harmful from uh, marijuana. So yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's a nice substitute. Um, <clears throat> My question, though, is not about marijuana. It's about your thoughts on psilocybin and oh, LSD yeah. mm -hmm. and, and where you think that that market is heading. I think the cat's out of the bag on marijuana, and we, we kind of yeah. know that that's, that's going in the direction it's going. Yeah. But what do you think about those other substances and um, you know, the benefits that, that we know about already? Totally. So I am, there's, a, there's a pretty uh, well-known book that came out a few years ago um, called How to Change Your Mind. And it's all about uh, these psychedelics, whether it's uh, psilocybin, which is, you know, mushrooms, uh, or LSD, or there's yeah, ayahuasca. There's, there's several different ones. And I am a huge believer in psychedelics as a therapy. I, uh, I mean, I didn't bring it up earlier, but when I was in college, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison before pharmacy school. And I did uh, uh, acid or LSD like my sophomore year in uh, college and it changed my life for the better. It made all my friends uh, call me after that, uh, after that time, first time I did it, they called me a PT, a, a post trip. I was uh, more confident. I felt like, I don't know, it just connected some things in my brain. I felt like I saw things clearly. And also I didn't really care. I cared a lot less what anybody else thought about my ideas on, on, on whatever, the, whatever the subject was. So. I personally have had my own, uh, you know, uh, very good experience with it. Uh, and I think that all the studies that have been coming out uh, more recently, I mean, completely prove it in terms of 
Uh, there's, you know, the, on, on all of these, they are, uh, there is real uh, data that shows that uh, things like uh, depression rates go go down in a huge way. There are, there's, there's, uh, there's people that are like, uh, you know, with, uh, I saw a study of people with terminal cancer that consumed psychedelics and they were like, they it completely changed, you know, their whole mindset and they, uh, and they were not uh, as depressed as, as I'm sure I would be. Uh, it's definitely from a therapeutic uh, point of view, I think it's gonna have a huge impact and has huge utility, especially over all these Prozac and you know, uh, all these uh, other uh, sort of uh, you know, no, more conventional pharmaceutical products. But I've had a lot of companies come to me that want investments into their psychedelics and I don't see, I haven't found one business case that I think makes sense. Like cannabis to me, it's a bigger market. It's a hundred plus billion dollar market. You know, like I said, thousands of years it's been used. Psychedelics, that is, uh, you know, something that people have started to really realize the benefits, you know, in more recent years. And it's, I can't imagine that psychedelics, you know, are more than, uh, you know, a $2 billion market right now. Uh, and also you can make a lot of product in the psychedelic space. It doesn't take up a lot of uh, a lot of room, you know. If you're making, uh, you know, uh, you know, they do acid, I think, on these like pieces of paper, uh, or you know, if you watch Breaking Bad, well, that's that's not a psychedelic, but uh, I was going to say you're making that crystal meth. Um, cannabis, I think that the extra level of uh, the sort of uh, moat around it is that it requires huge quantities of products to make to make uh, you know real money. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, therefore, I think it's, you know, less likely that, uh, that it could be like uh, commoditized down to practically nothing uh, the way that I think a lot of these uh, psychedelics could be just because you can make so many doses of it. But I love it as a, as a therapy, and I think that, uh, you know, more people, not less, should do it. I mean, that's, that's like, that's, uh, you know, to me, that's not, those aren't drugs, those are, those are medicine. I'm Wendy, um, and yes, all of that sounds awesome too, and I look forward to more of that research. Um, thank you for touching on the racial justice yeah. element of this. Um, it's, I, I think it's so wrong that white people are getting buckets and buckets of money when non-white people have been overwhelmingly incarcerated. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to get up and say that um, chronic pain also looks like me. Um, I struggle with IBS and digestion, and um, you know, you normally wouldn't know that by looking at me. So, mm. um, if weed has really helped me, um, be able to eat food and keep weight on. Mm. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Hi, make you turn around again. Hi. Hi. So I think all of this progress has been great. I just have one question that I don't feel the industry is really tackling. With the younger set, I have a 22-year-old, which I'm glad you said <laughs> under 21 you don't yes. recommend. But it's really interesting to me. I never hear anything about driving and the recreational use. Yeah. And I think he and his friends would never consider in this day of Uber drinking and driving. Right. But I just never hear anything mentioned. I mean, obviously, it goes for, for anyone, for adults, yeah, yeah, real yeah. adults also. Mm -hmm. But there's that disconnect with them. Yes. So... Cannabis and driving, there was uh, CNN, they have a really good series called Weed Inc. They've been doing it, Sanjay Gupta has been doing it for, for years. And he did a whole thing on cannabis with driving. And what you know he said and, and what he sort of observed, which I think I agree with is, people who consume cannabis more regularly, they drive like normal. They in fact are a little less aggressive. Uh, then they might be, uh, you know, like there's a joke like, you know, a can somebody that's high on, uh, on cannabis is more likely to, you know, uh, do 15 in, in a 50 than, you know, 100 in a 50 uh, mile per hour zone. Um, but what, uh, what Dr. Gupta, uh, you know, hypothesized is that uh, as, long as, as long as it's not the first time that you've done it, uh, generally there's not 
a uh, higher risk. There's certainly a lower risk than with alcohol. I mean, that's, you know, it's never, nobody's ever said, oh, as long as you, you know, you're, you're good at driving uh, while you're drinking, then you're, then you're fine. Uh, cannabis, they sort of, that is sort of the general view is that it's, uh, as long as somebody is not, uh, you know, drinking in addition to it or using other drugs in addition to it, and as long as they have some level of experience with driving uh, while they're, uh, you know, uh, high, then it actually, uh, there haven't been any higher accident rates or anything like that. So but interesting, because you can't judge what you're taking, I think, for younger people <laughs> recreationally. You know, you have this yep. gummy that the friend gave you versus something else. It's not like, you know, oh, I had one drink or two drinks. But, but I think that if you're, if you're like, if you had too much, gum, too many gummies or too high of a dose, you know. you're going to be like freaking <laughs> out usually like, uh, you know, and you're not going to like keep driving. You're probably going to pull off to the side of the road when people are, I think when they're drunk and they're driving, they just make really bad choices and they drive faster and their reaction times are, are obviously horrible. Uh, I think that <coughs> cannabis, it just doesn't generally make people aggressive. Mm -hmm even as it relates to driving. Uh, but with alcohol, you know, all bets are off. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. So this is a question about more the growing side of the yeah. business. So there's a lot of variability, uh, varieties, I understand. Yeah, all and different genetics. And all of those varieties have differing totally. components uh, that they output of the THC and so on. Where do you see that headed? Are we going toward a, a place where there's a standard or yeah. a place where there's uh, stronger plants? Where is going to play like crystal ball? Yeah, so in terms of THC levels, everyone always, anyone who is sort of experienced in cannabis will tell you that just pure THC levels are not the only predictor towards uh, whether, you know, sort of uh, how it's going to make you feel. Uh, and they often point out that you wouldn't go into a liquor store and just ask for the highest proof uh, alcohol. Uh, but all of that being said, everybody still practically all they care about is THC levels. And if we have, uh, when we have stuff that tests out at, you know, over 28 or 29 or 30 percent, it sells out in five minutes. And we have stuff, when we have stuff that tests out at 15 percent, you know, we're having to run specials on it uh, to try to get people to uh, take it. Uh, that is, there's been a movement towards more THC because that's what customers want. And it's been a little bit of a, you know, like an arms race sort of, uh, in terms of, uh, if companies aren't trying to grow the high CHC, then their products are just generally not going to do, uh, very well. There is with all of these strains, that is something that I think is very, it's very important, uh, in terms of being successful in the market as a, as a retailer, uh, is to be able to offer the uh, unique genetics that uh, people, people they, the 2080 rule as it applies to cannabis, like it applies to, you know, 2080 rule applies to almost any, everything uh, in my view, but the way it applies to cannabis is 20% of the people are buying 80% of the product uh, and almost all of them, those, so those are the high volume uh, buyers, and almost all of them like high quality, high THC flour and unique genetic strains because they, they've become such experts. They're like sommeliers, like wine sommeliers, where they can tell the difference between this one flower and they'll say, oh, this is the, you know, Bubba Kush uh, OG and this is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, sour diesel. There is, uh, it's a whole sort of uh, world that I didn't know, that I didn't really know much about, uh, you know, until the last, until the last few years. But that is a huge movement in the industry. I think the MSOs, the other larger companies, they don't get it as much as a lot of the smaller uh, companies uh, do because they're just like, you know, corporate, you know, weed people and they're, you know, uh, they just want to sell, you know, as many ounces or whatever as they can. Uh, that's something that at TerraSend that we focused a lot on. We do a lot of our own, what's called pheno hunting, where we buy thousands of seeds and it's called popping seeds where you plant them all, you have an R&D room and you pick out which ones look the best and then you take them to the next round and then, you know, and, you, and you're really focused on coming out with like, you know, one or two strains. It's also what pe keeps those 2080 buyers, those high volume buyers, they'll call your store uh, every day and say, hey, do you have any new uh, strains in house? That's what, keep, that's what keeps them coming into the stores. They want to know that there's uh, new stuff to come in and try. So. 
So yes, that's a, gonna be a huge part of the, uh, I think the future. Okay. Uh, I, 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 uh, well, I have the last or next to last question, but I think it's the most important. Is your company publicly traded and will we all make money if we invest in it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is publicly traded. So the issue that I mentioned uh, with the lack of uh, legislative progress is we can't be listed on a U.S. exchange like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange because we're operating and doing something illegal. The crazy thing is those Canadian companies that I mentioned that I realized pretty quickly they didn't have, based on the dynamics, they didn't have much of a future. Because they're operating totally legally, they're allowed to list on the U.S. exchanges. So companies like uh, Canopy Growth uh, or uh, Tilray, they're all traded on the NASDAQ and, they're, and they trade at higher price to sales multiples than the U.S. companies do because we are listed on the pink sheets, which it, the pink sheets, which is like, it's like not even considered an exchange. It's usually for lower quality companies that aren't, you know, uh, able to file all their financials. That's the, where we're listed there and we're listed in Canada on this little exchange called the CSE, the Canadian Stock Exchange. Uh, part of the progress uh, and the thing that I think the industry needs is uh, for the U.S. companies to be listed in the U.S. because if that happens, if we can list on the NASDAQ, I think, uh, I think uh, TerraSend and all of the, there's several other stocks that do, you know, are in the same space, they'll all go up two or 3x like the next day. Uh, and that will help access to capital. That will help, uh, in my view, that even helps uh, people uh, of color that are trying to get into the industry like Terrasan. We have a couple of programs where we uh, are supporting social equity uh, uh, applicants and, uh, and owners, but you know, money is tight right now because it's, it's, uh, it's harder uh, to access capital. In terms of does the stock go up, I can tell you only like like I'm the most uh, you know long term viewed person you probably you'd probably ever meet. I uh, over five years or three two three five years I think you're going to make money. Uh, the uh, I can never guarantee the uh, the the near term, but I think that we've got the best you know we have the best runway of assets. We are in New Jersey, which just went which just went wreck. So even uh, while g growth. Uh, may have slowed down in some of these other states like California and Oregon and all those. We, uh, that's a market that's gone from $200, $200 million in annual sales under medical to it'll be over a billion dollars this year. And we're one of the top players there. We have three amazing stores. These stores are, you know, I've said on our conference calls that they will uh, be run rating this year. We just opened them two months ago. They'll run rate this year on average uh, $50 million, uh, $40 million, I think I said, $40 million per store. I have a good friend who was the top guy at Starbucks. Their best store in the world does $4 million. So um, anyway, that's, uh, we, we have assets like that in Jersey and Pennsylvania and all of that, and those other markets are gonna be going wreck. But, uh, but uh, next, uh, you know, next six months, I can't guarantee anything. Uh, if you're looking for the long term, I think we're definitely gonna do well. Okay, last question. Well, TRSSF, TerraSend, TRSSF on the uh, pink sheets. Okay, thank you for letting me ask a question. And uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from around here. And uh, thank you for, uh, and, and this is a great place. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, what I've been learning about uh, the uh, Chautauqua and coming to these events is there are not a lot of challenges to the uh, speaker on certain yeah. things. And, and, um, and listening to this, I, I, I hear big money. All right, uh, in order to get it off the ground, unless you buy it illegally or yep. something like that, or want to start one of those. Yep. Um, big money means big cities, um, usually in order to recoup an ROI on the, uh, the uh, product. And then you also talk in comparison to Canada, which is about 10% of the size yep. of the United States in population. So th there are concerns, one that I have cause I grew up in the 70s, and I think I was doing something before I was 16, and that may be something. Yeah. And now, just recently, they came out that, hey, don't, as you said, don't, don't do it if you're younger than 21, but the statistics out there are showing four in 10 uh, uh, mm -hmm. high school mm -hmm. students are doing that. 
And even when we were growing up, or I was growing up, I went over to that guy and said, hey, can you buy me a six-pack of beer? You can keep the change. Yep. All right. Me and too. so, um, so there, you know, it's not panacea. I so, know it's going to help. I know it's coming. Yep. And, you know, my age and everything, I'm kind of glad it's coming. But yeah. there are um, people who are hiring workers who have to be drug-free. Yeah. And it, mainly it's difficult. And then have to worry about, okay, you know, you know, not only do we have to get, uh, you know, be able to have a driver's license, but also have to have a drug free. And it's difficult. Yes. Right? So you must know there's some, you know, challenges also. Oh, there's, there's and, tons and of I challenges. Heard much of those. Uh, oh, well, I mean, as I mentioned, the industry is extremely challenge, challenging uh, because of, uh, you know, a bunch of the things I mentioned. But in terms of, workers and drug testing that is that's a challenge it's it's you know what that's more of a challenge for the employers than it is for the cannabis industry because there are uh as as everybody knows even with the economy now whether we're in a recession or, or we aren't the only reason people are saying we aren't is because the job market is so tight uh and employers can't find good workers and if they have to now go exclude you know, I don't, I don't know what percentage of, uh, you know, ordinary Americans are consuming cannabis and that makes it so that they can't hire them. It really, it, it hurts them more than any, anyone. Uh, the, uh, the FBI, uh, there were some articles about how they have been talking about waiving the uh, zero tolerance uh, policy on uh, drug testing on cannabis as well because they're missing out on a lot of really smart um, People that could become that could be helping our uh, helping our country. It's it goes back, it goes against the whole stigma that we were talking about that it's just you know lazy people or or whatever it is uh, because there's a lot of really really smart people that uh, that consume cannabis and it's a shame that uh, there's still so many employers that uh, that aren't hiring. I would say that's that's been going away over the uh, over the years as well. And if you're in a state where it's legal medically, where, you know, uh, which is going to be more and more states. Uh, even if you're drug tested, I believe, if you have a prescription, then you're fine. I'm not sure that pertains to the FBI, but most uh, other regular employers, it's like the same way as uh, if you have a prescription for, you know, I know at, at Arbor Pharmaceuticals, or at our drug company, we, we did drug testing actually, and, uh, the, and anyone that had a, uh, had a medical uh, authorization, we were fine with. You can get what? Yeah, 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 yeah. And kid, oh, you brought up the kids about uh, about doing it when you were in high school. The thing is, there are multiple studies that show that states that have legalized cannabis, that uh, youth consumption rates do not go up. So, but my view is at least also, you know, that's sort of like you know, tons of uh, you know, kids across the country for forever have been uh, you know, uh, doing all that. I, at least in my view, at least if it's coming from, if they're stealing it from their parents' drawer or whatever, and it came from a dispensary, at least I know it's not sprayed with chemicals or has mold or any of the other stuff. At least it's gone through uh, safety testing and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jason. Thank you all for coming. This has been very